Okay, so good afternoon or good morning, everybody, depending on where you are. My name is Awasar. I'm Assistant Director for Academic Affairs African Studies Center here at Michigan State University. And welcome to another Iron Africa, our weekly seminary series. I'm very delighted today to have uh, Professor Thompson Bradley from University of Portsmouth, who's going to talk today. Uh, the title of her talk is Art, Heritage, and Resilience in South Sudan, a Gendered View. And before I pass it on to her, a brief uh, introduction. So Professor Thompson Bradley is a social anthropologist and applied researcher who has worked for over 20 years to end violence against women and girls by researching evidence around what works to end it. She is currently Professor of International Development at the University of Portsmouth and has projects across South Asia and Africa. Her research interests interest are in ending violence against women and girls, promoting social inclusion, including gender, disability, and mental health, harmful cultural practices, including female genital mutilation, forced marriage, and breast irony. Thompson has worked as part of large development programs, for example, Free Sudan from FGM, and now the FCDO program supporting the African-led movement to end FGM. Current research council, current research council, uh, current research include a project exploring art, heritage, and resilience in South Sudan. She has published four monographs, two edited volumes, and many journal articles. Her most recent volume is titled "Global Perspective on Violence Against Women and Girls," and that was published by Z Press in 2020. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Bradley, Bradley, for being here, and welcome. Thank you. I shall attempt to uh, share my screen now. Mm -hmm. uh, so tell me. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Yeah. Slideshow. Perfect. Good. Okay, well, let me just start by saying thank you so much to the Centre for African Studies for inviting me. It's a, a real honour and I'm really excited um, to give this talk today. It's the, it's the first time actually that this material um, has received a, a public airing. So um, I, I'm, I'm really interested to hear your questions and your um, feedback. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about the image on the um, title slide here. Um, it really sums up nicely the uh, topic and the focus of the research project that this paper today comes from. And you obviously see the USAID um, can there, but the artist is dipping um, his braids into it to colour ready for um, plaiting ready to make into into um, an object that can then go on to be sold. So I think it's a kind of lovely uh, contrast between the dominance of the humanitarian sector in South Sudan, but the resilience of those that are drawing on their cultural heritage to keep going um, and, and make a living. But also, as I'll come on to share, um, it does a lot more um, than just that. Um, and I also want, in terms of introducing this talk, I want to start with this quote that is taken directly from um, a female artist and uh, an embroiderer. Um, and she shared with us, the research team, the eye is the strongest thing. You draw every, everything, anything that comes to mind. Every woman is doing embroidery. No woman is idle because it is important in life of a woman when you come to that age, you start, you draw meaning. The skill will come to your mind, whatever you want in, in life. And the painting that goes along um, was uh, created by, um, in South Sudan, a famous artist called James Agrua. Um, and he, he's produced a number of paintings actually to go alongside um, the narratives that the, the research that I shall talk from captured. I'm going to come back to 
um, bed weaving a bit later, but I do want to say a little bit more about the woman behind that quote. So she's 33 years of age. She lives in Juba in South Sudan. Um, she makes a living, as I've said, from embroidering bed sheets. Um, and I think in this quote, it sums up so much because she's talking about how she draws on her imagination to create her designs and the designs um, that are, are beautiful and bring meaning to her life and to those um, that she sells her sheets to. And I'm going to show a bit later, you know, how important this, this process is in terms of, of building resilience, um, but also uh, resilience in, a, in an emotional but also an economic sense. I think this quote also shows the fundamental relationship between the art form and womanhood, how it's understood, that is, by many women in South Sudan. Um, so I'm going to share with you many more such um, passages that hopefully will take us deeper into this uh, really complex and nuanced um, world. I'm going to, in this talk, attempt to piece together the fragmented and insecure realities of the lives of women and men in South Sudan through the process of making different forms of art. I'm going to argue that art is an important way into a deeper, more nuanced picture of how women and men find and maintain resilience in humanitarian contexts of extreme crisis. Um, and I think you can see that already in what I've shared. The historical context in South Sudan is troubled. This is arguably the product of 60 years of colonial mismanagement, which entrenched earlier patterns of conflict related to the slave and ivory trade and subsequent decades of underdevelopment and regional civil wars. Prior to South Sudan's independence in 2011 and during decades long war of independence against Khartoum, South Sudan was severely aid dependent. The resumption of conflict means the country continues to rely heavily on external ex assistance. Famine in South Sudan is partly attributable to the breakdown of culturally mediated circulation of people, labour, livestock and grain. Currently in South Sudan, 7 million people are in need of, of aid. Um, as around March last year, 5.3 million people, so that's nearly half the population were estimated to be um, facing hunger. Levels of gender-based violence, which I'm going to focus particularly on today, are, are extremely high and actually place South Sudan at the top of the kind of global prevalence list. So clearly the dignity of most of the population has been severely compromised for a number of decades and with little sign of an end. Most of the population is multilingual and language groups do not neatly map onto the region's major livelihood zones, nor necessarily its broad divisions of political forms. People's success at coping with adversity and shock often depends on their ability to make use of the region's diversity by moving between livelihood, linguistic and sociocultural categories through long and short distance trade and cultural exchange. These processes are poorly understood and sometimes undermined by the humanitarian programming in South Sudan. And I will be giving a specific example of that in the context of how um, violence against women and girls is responded to. So moving on, in this talk, I will explore how both men and women make use of art as a form of expression, a cultural resource and a means of generating an income. I will also show what we can learn about gender and power through the relationships male and female artists have with their work. A focus on violence against women and girls highlights starkly a contradiction. The image of patriarchal relationships, the statistics on the prevalence of violence against women in the country contradicts the picture of love and adoration, particularly seen through the way that male artists talk about the motivation for their um, work. Furthermore, in taking a closer look at how the humanitarian sector responds to violence against women, we see a missed opportunity to build more effectively on art as a social and cultural resource. Women use the space in which they create art together to share problems and process um, trauma. 
Yeah, as I come on to show, the humanitarian sector makes the facilitation of imposed safe spaces a core activity in its programming, not realising the extent to which art making already creates them. So I'm just going to introduce the, the methodology behind um, this research. We developed and used um, an approach that we term story circles, and this is a picture of one such um, story circle. Essentially, we gathered together groups of artists, different genres of art, and sometimes a mixed group. Um, and we asked them to talk about their art form. And that really represented a very gentle um, and sensitive way into discussions that were far more complex about um, the history of the conflict, the um, history of their lives in terms of how they responded to the conflict, their movements, their traumas, their hopes, and the things that kept them and keep them going. So that was the technique. The technique in turn was facilitated by a core group of researchers who were graduates from the University of Juba and the Catholic University in South Sudan. So these are just some pictures um, of the students during um, one of their training workshops. Um, and as part of the process of kind of inducting them into how to facilitate a story circle, we asked them to bring uh, an art, a piece of art that resonated with their, with their lives, either currently or, or in the past. Um, and the group of researchers were deliberately from different, different ethnic groups, because as I'll come on to talk about diversity of South Sudan in terms of its arts form is quite immense. So it was important that our research group reflected that. Um, and what we found, it was it was an incredibly exciting and dynamic um, process because the researchers really were enthused. They were not necessarily, um, wouldn't consider themselves to be artists, but at the same time felt connected to the pieces that they brought. And actually just in, in talking about the importance of those pieces with or showing, for example, a dance or um, in this picture, you'll see one of the female researchers is showing um, the beads that she actually made um, herself. Really gave them a strong sense of pride, but also facilitated dialogue between these different um, ethnic groups and ethnic conflict, intercommunal violence is is so embedded in South Sudan that it was incredible to see how, um, how easy and safe these conversations across these groups can emerge through a focus on art. And the clipboard just shows the kind of discussions that we were trying to get at in terms of the links between cultural heritage um, as a way of understanding, belonging and expressing identity and how that links into more kind of uh, development concept, concepts of sustainability and livelihood and mental health um, and resilience. So that's to give some sense of the, the method, methodology that we use. If there's any more questions, we can come back to that um, later. But I want to just say a little bit about the diversity um, of art in South Sudan. Um, as I've already touched upon, the kind of lack of human dignity presented by, by conflict and the very high levels of gender-based violence that we see um, in South Sudan, it contrasts very starkly with the rich, diverse and cultural heritage of the country. So South Sudan is not a monolithic entity, and this equally applies to its cultural and artistic output. With a population estimated at around sort of 10 million, there were 60 nine living languages, diverse and flexible social and political arrangements, and a territory of approximately a quarter of a million square miles. So South Sudan is vast and it's heterogeneous. And it's difficult, if not impossible, in this context to make generalizations across different artistic and cultural forms. The tangible and intangible cultural heritage of South Sudan comprises a wide array of mediums, genres and forms, including and I've listed them there for you, storytelling, poetry, song, dance, and other expressive and performative traditions, sculpture, architecture, pottery, woodwork, metalwork, painting, as well as beadwork and embroidery and, and many other crafts. 
These pre-colonial practices and traditions, which have also been shaped by and adapted to colonialism, urbanisation and globalisation, did not occupy an autonomous zone of aesthetics, but were rather woven into the daily and seasonal life of the community, carrying a community's values, beliefs and systems of knowledge across social domains and generations. Scholars and practitioners have long recognised the power of traditional arts and cultural practices, such as performance traditions, so ritual dance and theatre, and verbal expressive traditions, so poetry, song and storytelling in Africa, as sources of healing, stability and regeneration, as well as sanctioned vehicles for the critique of authority. The endurance of these forms, as well as their adaptability, make them particularly important sources of knowledge. So just, I'm sure many of you are quite familiar with the um, political economies, the conflict in South Sudan, but I just want to just very quickly give an overview for those of you that may be less, um, less aware. Um, so, I mean, I've already, and, it, and it's important as well to give this context in terms of trying to understand and explain the very high levels of violence against women and, and girls and the challenges that face those that are trying to end it. So as I've stated, the, the country gained its independence in 2011. That's after 50 years of civil war with what is now is Sudan. The Sudan People's Liberation Movement signed the first comprehensive peace agreement actually in 2005, providing the base for the arrangements for South Sudan's independence, which was finally realized in July 2011. However, peace was short lived and in December 2013, a new wave of conflict, this time internal to newly independent South Sudan, broke out between the president Salva, Salva Kiir and the vice president Rick Machar. The dispute opened up along ethnic lines as the ruling presidential party is and was made up of the Dinka ethnic majority, while the opposition consisted primarily of the second largest grouping, the newer. The conflict that unfolded saw tens of thousands killed and three million people displaced both to neighbouring countries and also internally with around 200,000 people being forced to move into UN protection of civilian camps set up within South Sudan's borders. In its short history, the country suffered from waves of conflict shifting from one peace agreement to another with little hope of long term stability in sight. In August 2015, a new peace agreement was signed, but this was short-lived with violence breaking out again within a year. The July 2016 conflict saw Rick Machar flee the country, opening up an opposition power vacuum and the installation of a new vice president to Van Deng. In August 2016, from the Juba-based faction of the SPLM in opposition, a further peace agreement was signed in Khartoum in June 2018. So as it stands, and these statistics come from the UNHCR January, um, so last month, 2021, reported 2,300,000 refugees from, from South Sudan, and 65% of those are under the age of 18. So it really makes it primarily a children's crisis. So I think that that's important background. I want to also draw attention to the importance of cattle um, as a central dimension pillar of the country's economy, which also um, has resonance in terms of, again, explaining the patterns and the high levels of violence against um, women. So in addition to this, this political conflict, the country is plagued by intercommunal tensions, primarily fueled by cattle wealth, or rather the drive to accumulate wealth through cattle. This economic reality sees violence erupt through cattle raiding that in parallel results in women and girls being abducted for marriage. 33% of the 65% reported sexual violence cases um, that women and girls endure is said to be the result of non-partner abduction linked to cattle raiding and displacement. And that statistic comes from um, a piece of research conducted by the International Rescue Committee published in 2017. Additionally, and as covered in more detail shortly, women and girls are subjected to a number of other cultural practices that are themselves violent or that lead to violence, including um, a bride price, child marriage, polygamy and wife 
inheritance. So while difference in prevalence and types of violence abuse can be seen across the country, violence against women is widespread and often predominantly linked, as I said, to bride price. This is especially true among the majority new and Dinka ethnic groups. Bride price remains at the center of much of the customary economy and effectively reduces women to commodities to be bought and used and therefore abused by husbands who in effect feel ownership over them. Levels of abuse and violence suffered by women and girls became profound and entrenched during the conflicts that have been sustained almost constantly since the independence of the Sudan in 1956. In particular, rape has been systematically deployed across warring factions as a weapon of war. Um, the consequences for women and girls' health and well-being are considerable and largely, I would argue, unmet by the humanitarian response. The many years of conflict in South, southern Sudan before it became South Sudan allowed violence against women to become more widespread. And it left behind numerous long-term consequences for women, including health problems, psychological trauma, and high levels of HIV um, infection. So I think we can strongly see the evidence to say that violence is normalized in, in the lives of women and girls um, in South Sudan. So just to give some context in terms of the, the most recent prevalence data that we have, before this study that was conducted by the International Rescue Committee in 2017, we didn't have any prevalence data for South Sudan. Um, so in this study, they reported that whilst many women, so 33% of their respondents reported instances of rape by strangers during conflict, um, which is mo in most cases committed by military combatants, intimate partner violence remained the most common form of violence and prevalence spiked during unrest and spikes during unrest. The research recorded that a staggering 73% of women had experienced sexual violence by a partner in some parts of the country. Um, and just to pull out one quote from that report that's particularly poignant, while women and girls were often subject to sexual violence by armed actors, they also felt the impact of conflict in a number of other ways, experiences of displacement, the breakdown of rule of law, increases in crime and the normalization of violence also affect um, violence against women and girls. These indirect experiences of conflict have an impact on violence at home. So there's a relationship between these different forms of, of violence. Um, and I think that's really important to note. So I've given you the context. We've, we've gone through in a, in a very brief whistle-stop way, the political um, economy, if you like, of the conflict. We've looked at the rates of violence against women and girls. So we've set the scene. I now want to turn to just giving you, again, a, a relatively brief overview of the humanitarian response to violence against women and girls. Um, and I think we can categorize the activities in this space um, under three headings. Um, so, Firstly, women and girls friendly um, spaces, which is particularly um, popular. And in this approach, um, you know, essentially organizations create um, spaces and invite both in communities, but also in the protection of civilian sites. They create these, these spaces and in these spaces, case management is overseen psychosocial support is given but also skill building and kind of recreational activities are facilitated that are understood or hope to promote social networks and community um, integration so these spaces are seen as central sites in which resilience is built with some project documents that we've reviewed actually making claims such as they are a place where women meet with other women and share their learning and experiences on various issues they are facing from the crisis in their lives and help each other build um, resilience. So if these are also spaced from within these um, groups, organizations also select women to go on into other programs. So for example, the economic empowerment programs 
um, that quite often target um, women, candidates will be selected from within these spaces. So linked to, I mean, these activities are, you can see a link between them, but awareness raising and psychosocial interventions um, are, are quite specific in the sense that they target and they seek to ensure that those women and girls, men and boys that are affected um, by crisis in South Sudan are aware of their rights and their entitlements. So this is the sort of empowerment um, agenda. And again, project doc documents often make statements like there's a lack of awareness of human rights, there's an existing tolerance of gender-based violence and a hostile community environment that needs to be systematically addressed to prevent violence. And there's this the view that survivors of violence need to be given the confidence to report and seek um, services. So the kind of topics that are covered um, underneath this kind of heading of awareness raising focus on giving information about what, um, what somebody should do if they um, fall victim to, to physical or sexual assault. So encouraging reporting within a 72 hour window so that forensics can be um, collected, for example. So these sessions will be facilitated by community outreach um, workers and, and again operate within these women and girl friendly um, spaces. But there's also wider kind of community engagement and, and going door to door to promote um, awareness. So you can see there's a strong emphasis on the promotion of rights-based um, messaging. But arguably this can actually backfire in two ways. So firstly, this kind of rights-based messaging can undermine community cohesion as it exists in communities in South Sudan, because some concepts and terminology that use really emphasize this notion of individual um, agency as opposed to wider group agencies. So it's generally associated with threats to cohesion and an idealized moral economy of kinship and reciprocity. So community volunteers are positioned to broker these concepts and terminologies in ways that may be perceived as meddling and intrusive. Um, so for example, accusations have been recorded at community level um, towards community volunteers that they are actually dividing families and dividing communities. So there's a, a perception also that programming, including the economic empowerment activities, that they only benefit women. And this again leads to a sense of marginalization among men and boys, which then leads to further kind of hostility and tension towards the program um, and also can generate backlash increases in violence towards um, women rather than decreasing. So findings that raising women's level of consciousness regarding their individual rights can be disruptive to local norms and may result in additional um, violence. And I think these findings are actually in line with um, what we see elsewhere. But I also want to talk about the complexity and how these programs are even delivered. So we have, for those of you unfamiliar with kind of how international development operates, you have your donor, you have your implementing partner, and then you have what are called downstream partners. So these um, activities are actually delivered by community um, organizations. And these community organizations are in a really difficult um, position because they are rooted in the, in the places that they're working. And um, their workforce are made up of people that are um, part of the, the community. So they hold a great deal of cultural knowledge. They also understand the negative impact that some of these imposed approaches may actually bring. So what we've been able to capture is a process through which these organizations are almost culturally interpreting or translating these big humanitarian um, programs. Um, and just to give you one interesting and, and uncomfortable to some extent, but also really important to, to um, capture and, and think about example, and it's a, it's a, it is an anecdotal to some extent um, example in terms of we don't know how um, often it happens, but one organization working and facilitating one of these women um, and 
girls friendly spaces actually within these spaces in under the banner of awareness raising and giving psychosocial support began to talk to um, the women present about being subservient so actually reducing tension at home by being subservient um, so obviously that um, contradicts kind of feminist thinking around both the causes and triggers of violence but how but also how you should um, confront it now interestingly this particular approach was felt to have a positive effect in actually reducing instances particularly of intimate partner violence so again, anecdotally, but the organization recorded both women saying, oh, as a result of taking this approach, um, we're, getting, we're getting subjected to less physical abuse. Husbands also claimed that things were much, were more peaceful um, at home. So whilst that's uncomfortable to hear in some level, at some level, we've also got to ask the question, why did these community organizations need to translate and interpret um, these activities in the way that they have done, uh, in a way that you could say fits within the status quo of the gender and cultural and social norms of these communities. Well, part of it is in order to reduce the tension and the backlash from these kind of very alien approaches, but also it's about being able to demonstrate success. Continued funding in the humanitarian development sector is very much tied to success, being able to demonstrate in a violence against women program that you've successfully done just that. So they were able to successfully demonstrate just that, but not through um, the means that, that we might um, be comfortable with. So what I will go on to talk about when I give the examples of the particular um, art forms is also to, to demonstrate the kind of patronizing, if you like, tone to all of this, this assumption that women and girls don't already create these kind of spaces for themselves. And as I've already said, you know, the sitting down and embroidering a bread sheet with other women um, actually automatically creates that space and automatically opens up the opportunity to share, um, to share trauma, but also to share positive, motivating um thoughts and and also these are spaces in which young girls are taught from a very young age so malaya is the term that's given to this particular art form of embroidering cloth to make bed sheets and you can see this beautiful picture of a young girl learning how to do just that so it's you know it's an art form that is passed down mothers and sisters passing down younger siblings and daughters um, and because it's so important it provides an income um, it creates these spaces, it, it provides confidence and psychological determination. And I will demonstrate that more clearly when I, when I talk you through some of the discussion that happened in the story circle connected to, to the bedsheets. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause now so you, you have a, a break from listening to me because I actually want to now show you a short um, film that was put together by the film director Atem Benny, who's featured um, here in, the, in this slide. Um, he thankfully was quite happy for me to show you his, um, his face. And he's the director of the Likakiri Collective. So the Likakiri Collective were our key partner and, and have been for a number of years and on a number of, of projects. Um, and it's actually Atem that is responsible for overseeing the creation of the story circle um, approach and in the film that you're about to see um, he's captured from a number of different artists in uh, mainly uh, Juba their reflections on the process but also something about the importance of what they what they do so Let the Gaku do for Zoa, 
Bada mara jinu bi ali deka jinu so wa kin jo kasindi akwa tane mundu bi. Bada mara jinu bi roli deka kudru so wa. Bada mara jinu bi roli deka kudru so wa. شايف السمح الشديد عشان في حاجات يعني الناس ما بيعرفوها 
عنده زول تاني نحن محتاجين دليل نعرف لازم نمشي ناخده من الزول ده والزول التاني عنده حاجة برضه بنمشي بناخده لما نتجمع في محل واحد أكيد بدينا معنى تاني كبيرة وهنا التراث بتوسع أنا بمشي طوالي عشان شنو الأم أكو حاجات ناديك عليه ألا ونضيف أي عشان شنو الناس كان ما في بيته ما بعرف أي حاجة بيته بعفة أنا الناس يجي الناس ما أيوة كلام علي قبل كده إذا ما أسمع إذا ما أسمع يلا إذا بتذكر في ما بفتح يلا كان إذا قاعد ما يلا كنا أنا قاعدين كده وأنا ما لنا كده جدا جدا انه البرنامج ده لو في تواصل ممكن ان احنا نقدر نواصل وثاني نبدا عشان نعلم الناس الثانيين الحمى ما يعرفوا عن الكالشة حاجه وما يعرفوا عن الاغاني حاجه انه ديل كيف ان احنا نقدر نعرفه ونقدر نتعامل مع الحاجات الفرق الشعبيه والكالشة بتاع جنوب السودان الفن ده حاجه بتاع فرح في كل تراث الفن وفرح إذا كان الناس يتلموا في 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 التراث أكيد بيفرحوا، لما الناس بيبقوا فرحانين مع بعض أكيد حيكون في السلام، يعني الفن دايما ما بوصل زول محل مشاكل، ما بوصل ليه غطاطة في قلبك، ما بخليك تزعل من زول، لكن الفن بيخلي الإنسان يفرح، عشان أنت تفرح أكيد في السلام، يعني الشغل ده مجال انتم بتعملوا ده ده مجال بتاع فرح ده مجال بتاع السلام بلم الناس انا كفنان وانت فنان بتاع تراث انا بتاع تراث اذا لمينا في محل ما هم اكيد ما هنشاكل لكن نفرح مع الناس الموجودين معانا يبقى في السلام ديروا ناس يجيبوا ناس كتير في معانا دي يلا انا بقول او تاني بيودوني او في المندر يوري كلام ده للناس عشان يشيلوا في عفطه راس الناس، الناس بعفطه كلام ده، كلام ده سامي سامي. So I should have said that was the world premiere of that um, that film. You can see that we've. Uh, some editing still needs to, to happen but I really wanted to share that with you today because I think it just really brings everything that I'm trying to to communicate to life and I think you can see from that the the joy and the um, emotional comfort to some degree that is gained through art either on an individual basis or coming together so coming together more than than anything that brings that that sense of um emotional and psychological resilience. So I'm just going to talk now through um, a number of different art forms, but offer you a kind of gendered perspective um, on them. I'm going to come back again to, um, to, to bed sheets um, and to give you this quote from one of the artists who said, I embroider the beauty that is in my head and not the dead trees around me, which is exceptionally poignant given the, the history of South Sudan. And we can see through the data, that, through the listening to these narratives, how just the simple yet beautiful art form can do many things simultaneously. So the process of embroidering bedsheets creates spaces for women to come together to share experiences and chain each other. Um, and this quote that I've given you, it, obviously it, it talks of the beauty that comes from the imagination, not the realities of hardship around. So the creative process itself is beneficial, giving time to process and strategize. Most importantly, bed sheets fetch significant figures and are prized marriage gifts. Many women proficient in this art have been able to sustain themselves and their children when displaced from other family due to the conflict. I'm not proposing bedsheet embroidery as an alternative response to violence against women, but merely pointing to the insights and the experiences of resilience that emerge because of it. The stories in the circle contrast starkly with the current dominance in humanitarianism of the kind of approaches that I've, I've talked to you about, particularly the psychosocial approach. 
The process of embroidering with other women creates space for them to speak about their lives and their art form. And listening to them speak, we can understand the complexity of resilience. But financial independence is critical. And so too is the self-worth and the dignity that comes through the process. So, I mean, the, the problem with the humanitarian response to violence is really that there's little evidence that the current interventions, which frankly are adapted from Western counselling models of trauma response actually work or that the women see them as helpful. Secondly, violence has to be conceptualised within a wider set of social and gendered relationships and that woven within them are a number of different ways that women generate and sustain social and cultural capital in order to both survive and also maintain well-being. So this particular story circle took place in September 2019 and consisted of seven women. They were all married and aged um, between mid-20s to 50s, but very strong messages of resilience came through as the women shared their motivations for embroidering bedsheets. Um, so one woman shared, I still do bedsheets for myself and for selling. I sell to help my children. The view was clear. If you have a handicraft, it can help your children. Another woman shared, in fact, in rescue, it rescued me and my children who were doing exams. To me, these boys are my life. I embroider for my future to build a house, this embroidery I do at home, and it's my skill, which means that I can help my husband and children and my husband doesn't feel all the pressure. And sort of going back to the trigger points for the high levels of intimate partner violence, we know there's a strong link between poverty and gender norms around masculinity um, and the pressure to be a breadwinner in these sorts of environments um, is massive and is acknowledged to be a trigger point. So you can, you can see um, just in this quote, the understanding that this woman has of that pressure and how her art form is, is one way of being able to alleviate some of that pressure, which makes her life better and life of her husband and children also. So there's an important link between income generation from selling bread sheets and marriage. Now to come back to um, bride price that I've already touched on and I've given you the, the feminist critique of bride price as a process that commodifies women and makes them vulnerable to violence. So there's a, there is an irony that actually um, the time of bride price, bride price itself operates and generates a market that women are then able to sell their bed sheets um, through. So it generates the market for bed sheets. Um, so there is there is that 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 irony that's clearly there. Um, you know, women shared bed sheets are the first gift given to the groom's family. The value of bed sheets is in, is huge. They're expensive, um, so marriage is a key key marker. So the circle revealed that it's not just the income attached to bed sheets, but it's also a great deal of emotional expression, and it's really important to have this balance in how we how we see the impact. So another woman shared. We women, we don't give to anyone. You you give, you have to give to someone who is dear and you value. So you don't give to just anyone. So giving or selling bed sheets is also an expression of love and affection. So the emotional dimension to bed sheets can also be seen in a strong link to self-esteem. So another woman said, I mean, when you clothe the bed with this, you will find yourself that you are a woman. I mean, when you clothe the beds, with these, you will find yourself changed in the house and your self-esteem goes high when your guests come and you feel yourself, you are a woman, you can see how it is. And when guests come and see the sheets and marvel, you will be very happy. Concerns were also discussed in the circle over losing the practice to commercial industrial production. So it was shared, machine embroidery is there, like this one has been done. But we, for us women of South Sudan, we love, the thing that you do with your own hands. That is why you see it many, even for example, I have a daughter and she's getting married, but if I do set to do embroidery, they will know I have something of value with strong meaning. That is why we see that we are not going to leave even though a company comes and better and better comes the things you make with your own hands. So there's a sense of pride and dignity that's clearly um, clearly there and a sense of passing this down. Um, social capital is also clear. One woman shared, 
So they are here as a group of women and they are good to each other and they chat. So emotional and psychological resilience is critical in enjoying decades of uncertainty and insecurity. Another woman shared, I embroider things that link to mood, for instance, a vase or an ornament, a plant like you can see in this one. For me, I will be in my dark room, but looking at the flowers. I mean, I love them. A human can live by this bedsheet. Another woman shared, the bedsheet, it will come. It, should, it will come out like the flower you wanted. One day I sewed a bedsheet with colors and it was an elephant. I was in yay. One night I covered my head with a bedsheet. I saw an elephant, I liked it. I drew it immediately at night using a torch. It was going well. I drew it on, on a white bedsheet. You look for the drawings that go close to the one you have in your mind. If brown is out there, it won't be good. And the place of red, if green is put, it won't be good. And the place of violence is brown and it won't be good. So in these passages, the process of designing and sewing the sheets offers an escape from the violence around. Looking at the finished piece brings happiness and self-esteem. The trees, you cannot draw it as it is not beautiful, but there are some beautiful trees you can draw like these. Clearly through this one story circle, an incredibly rich and touching picture um, emerges, depicting a variety of ways resilience is expressed and experienced. So to move now, to talk to you a little bit about um, the art of, of wood carving, which is a male um, art form. So it's only undertaken by men. So I've got a few quotes that come from, from this story circle that again um, gives us this really beautiful picture of uh, men drawing their inspiration from their female companions and from, and from the women in their lives, which contrasts against that very startling statistic around intimate partner um, violence. And it, and it gives us, I think, an important understanding um, or picture of men and women being caught in this environment of intense um, pressure that operates to trigger, trigger violence as a, as a response. But actually, if you step back and look again at gender and relationships through the inspiration attached to, to art, you, can, you, you get a different picture. So in this story circle, one man shared, wood carving is for those people who want their love to remain forever. If you buy a piece for your lover and he or she puts it in her or his house, even if you are no longer together, this ornament will remain at home. When you see it, you will remember your lover and say, ah, this was my first friend. Song, another, uh, quote from the same story circle, Song, songs are available to inspire, but in wood carving, you work alone. You will remember a person and carve for them. And then you will remember forever the person you were thinking about at that moment. So that's a really beautiful and poignant reflection again of, of what drives and motivates this uh, other wood carvers to, to create their art. Um, so again, the same themes come through of a strong sense of pride, of, the, of an importance of cultural heritage and dignity. Um, and all of this contrasts quite starkly against the very sort of scientific way that development understands um, resilience. The last art form that I want to share with you is the art of basket making. Um, and this is a really interesting because unlike most of the art forms, men and women um, braid um, together. So it's not a male dominated or female dominated art form, but actually men and women will sit together, husbands and wives will sit together um, and create the same, the same um, art, the same basket. There is a gender dimension in the sense that the purpose of, for example, the baskets are intended for uh, male or female, mainly female um, work. So for example, um, baskets are made to carry sorghum or made, and that's a female activity, or they're made to um, carry a woman's clothes into her marital um, village or for collecting ground nuts. So, you know, again, all of these are kind of gendered activities. So there's a link again between the, the baskets and then these very gendered um, activities. And similar to talking to the male artists in connection with the wood carving, talking to the male basket 
basket um, weavers, they will talk again about their art being inspired by women. Um, so, for example, in the, the sort of first quote, it reads, um, the girl is remembered while braiding, happening um, a lot, a lot of moral boosting, and it also gives you an appetite for work. Um, also in that same circle, there was a song um, we sang when young while braiding. There was a song sung for a girl, the girl of my companionship. You sing and remember the girl. You will have clear fantasies um, in your heart. So again, really beautiful and really um, poignant about the emotional kind of motivation behind this um, art form. But I think that image for me of the man and and male and female basket we were sitting together husband and wife in a harmonious um, act of creating these be really beautiful um, baskets is again contradicts again the, the statistics that we see and it's just really important um, that we have this more nuanced um, view so I know I do not have I have maybe three minutes left um, according to my clock. So just to make some concluding uh, remarks. Well, my PowerPoint's obviously decided to shut me off before I'm ready, but anyway, there we go. So concluding remarks. Um, I would advocate really to use art heritage as a lens, a really important lens in trying to understand um, the complexity of of the situation that men and women, boys and girls find themselves in. It challenges assumptions in a really critical and important way around why violence happens. Um, and it also really opens up that discussion. It isn't men against women. It's actually about the environment um, and the history of that environment that men and women and boys and girls have found themselves in. It also, I think, offers us insight into where the entry points to change um, may be. And it really does, in a context like South Sudan, evidence clearly that art is an important resource for resilience. Um, and without it, the struggle would be, um, would be even greater. So it's this resource that's found um, from within from art, but it's also, as I've talked and referred to many times, the kind of economic reality that art is able to, to provide. So I will stop there and open up to questions. Thank you so much, Professor Bradley. That was a very interesting presentation. Uh, and please uh, use the Q&A space to write your questions if you have any. Uh, I, I was... Like in the in the video that you showed, I was I noticed the reference of the importance of knowing your culture. There are many people who don't know their culture. Uh, how do you explain this sense of uh, loss that I'm feeling? These people don't know their culture, so there is this need to get connected to the culture. So. Is it because of the violence or is it just the environment, the space that was provided for them uh, to talk about? Uh, so I would appreciate some clarification. I, I'm just a little bit mystified by this sense of losing their culture. Where it's I think, I mean, it's a really important question and I don't think this is, I don't think I'm going to give you a very straightforward answer um, because that this sense of a loss of heritage or fear of losing heritage, yes, because of the conflict, because of being displaced, because of not being able to actually even access and buy the materials that, that are needed to, to create um, the art. So there's all of that kind of sense of loss, but there's also... Um, and actually, there's a kind of a longer quote that came from the wood carving story circles that I didn't read out. There's also this sense that the younger generation do not appreciate the importance of this traditional um, heritage. So there's a real anxiety that um, as generations go by, there's going to be a loss 
you know, in terms of, you know, when baskets woven in a way that are no are replaced by plastic ones, um, or when the wood carving or the bed sheets just are no longer appreciated or seen as as valued and um, sought after, there's loss not just in terms of that financial, much less actually the financial loss. It's that kind of emotional and identity loss, and I think in a in in a context that suffered so much displacement, it's that um, anchoring around identity and belonging. Um, in the uh, you know people are mixed, so you're no longer in necessarily living with your uh, community, your village. So you're in a mix, particularly in the camps, um, in the protection camps, you are living um, potentially in much more kind of ethnically diverse context than you would otherwise. And there's the sense that the impact that that will have on your identity and how you see yourself and how you understand yourself. Um, and I think you get a sense that, that that anchoring is really important. Again, it's that kind of psychological strength that you need to be able to withstand the unpredictability and the fragility of that of that context. So, um, so there's definitely that anxiety is about generations being influenced by YouTube and not wanting to sing and dance in the same way. There's a lot of we had quite a lot of interesting intergenerational discussion around that. But also we found, in particular when we brought our researchers together, who are, you know, they're all of a younger generation, brought them together and they were asked to bring art that they remember from their childhood or that's in their homes. And you could see immediately that connection and that knowledge that actually they admitted they didn't realise that they had or they just took it for granted. So in a sense, it's that that anxiety of losing it may not be losing forever but it's just that it's remembered um, and it's talked about and it's captured in a different way so I mean these are kind of all questions to to really delve into in a little bit more detail so I don't know if that's <laughs> that's yeah. answered your question it's not my attempt <laughs> no you did thank you uh, I guess I I I Maybe if you can tell us a little bit more about the population, because are they living in camps even right now? Or um, yeah, there's still there were still around uh, two hundred thousand people living in these uh, in the uh, protection of civilian sites mm. um, that the UN UMIS um, basically uh, monitors or um, coordinates facilitates. So, and these are people that obviously have come from right into the, from the interior of South Sudan. Um, and then you also have people that are, are settled. Um, I mean, most of the, the story circles that we, that we ran were Juba based. So whilst we were able to cover, I mean, Juba is useful in the several research in the sense that you can capture the diversity of South Sudan in Juba itself. Um, so there are and communities that are settled. So it's almost like people are living side to side. Some of the artist mentors that we had as part of the project were themselves living inside the protection of civilian camps. Thank you very much. Uh, I have one question. In my community, bright price is an important part of our culture. In our traditional communities, there was no commercialization of bright price. It was never about selling daughters. I think that commercialization comes from within and without, from greedy parents and other community members, as well as from people looking in from outside who look at it as at face value. Uh, so yeah, I, I mean, there's, there's lots of different, uh, obviously, interpretations and meaning that can be attached to bride price. It depends on your um, perspective. I think in the context of South Sudan, and I take the point in terms of the kind of commercialized, commercialized um, aspect of the, of the practice may be more intense or prevalent in, in one context compared to um, another. But I think we have to remember, again, in a really extremely poor and fragile context where the economy is so dependent on cattle and cattle is such a major part of the bride price um, exchange, that really when you, when you have nothing, 
when you have nothing, but you know when your daughter gets married, it's going to bring you cattle, then there is a kind of process of commodification that goes on because you need um, you need cattle to be able to survive. It's as simple as that. And I think it's understood. Um, and I think you know daughters themselves understand that out of respect and honor for their family, it's a necessary process because that is the, that's the economic situation. Um, but the implications of that transaction, we can see the evidence is quite clear in the context of South Sudan that it does have this, this knock on and negative impact in terms of um, disempowering women to the extent that they're vulnerable. Professor Konini, do you want to talk? You raise your hand. Do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for this very interesting discussion that uh, you presented. I really enjoyed it. Um, you, you, you talked about different languages that they do have, uh, over 65 languages. Now, when you have those meetings with women doing all that art and singing, are they singing in different tribal groups or are they, are they using a common language? How do you uh, handle that? So in the, the story circles, the artists um, were communicating in their, in their first language. So in the language that relates, relates to, their, um, to their grouping, to their ethnicity. Um, so our researchers, we drew our researchers from across that diversity. We, we, we didn't capture 69, we didn't have 69 story circles covering the 69 languages. Um, that just wasn't possible, but we had a pool of about 20, 25 researchers from different um, ethnicities across South Sudan, and they were trained to facilitate these story circles and were able, therefore, to facilitate them in the language that the artists were um, spoken. Um, you know, in terms of common language in South Sudan, I mean, that's an interesting question. I mean, there's Juba um, or South Sudan Arabic and there's English. But I mean, that's not in terms of trying to um, to listen to people expressing how they feel about the world. It's important, obviously, that that's that, that that's done in 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 a person's first language. So that but that's how we navigated it. It was really important that our pool of researchers re reflected the diversity of the art that we were trying to record. Thank you. And a question here. Thank you for your presentation. Beside conflict and war, violence against females in South Sudan and other settings is often rooted in cultural beliefs and practices. War only aggravates the existing problem. How are such cultural factors reflected in your research? Yeah, so I mean, I, I would agree with that. Um, and I touched on a few of the cultural practice. There's a kind, there's a an intersection between um, different cultural practices and then different forms of violence, from sexual violence to emotional, psychological abuse to physical abuse, um, and a whole array of of perpetrators. So we see polygamy, we see bride price, we see um, norms around um, inheritance, women's inheritance interplay in South Sudan. We see obviously a very weak um, justice system. We see a tension between a, um, a, a more westernized justice system and a, a customary system. So there are tensions um, at that level. But I think what's important in terms to understand the role that cultural practices play in terms of creating the culture, feeding into and creating the kind of gendered cultural and social norms that shape the environment that in turn normalize violence. So sometimes it gets, the arguments can get a little bit, not abstracted, but it's, there's not necessarily an immediate link between forms of cultural practice and then violence against women. But we've got to a point now in the field where we, we can see very strongly in evidence the negative impact that certain practices has, have, particularly in, in rendering women vulnerable to these kind of physical and extreme forms of um, violence. There's still a lot of work 
um, that we need to do, but links, for example, between um, child marriage and bride price and poverty and climate change and then intimate partner violence. You know, all of these these factors link link together, but they don't necessarily have to translate into violence, but there's something about the gendered ideology that structures um, societies across the globe. Um, so we need to be clear about that. This is not a South Sudanese um, unique problem. It's across the whole globe. But I think the way that we understand and unravel the particular nature of how violence manifests is contextual. So we do need to understand at quite a micro contextual level um, what the particular triggers are in that context. And I think in South Sudan, we can see it's multi-layered in terms of the history of conflict, the history of colonization, how that's borne itself out, these different cultural practices, um, even the, um, the way in which people are constantly moving about also, I think, has, um, has an impact. But I think what looking deeper into and through an art heritage lens tells us is that that's not the whole story. So those the reality that ends in that situation needs to be contrasted against these um, these insights in, of deep respect, actually, and these moments where um, we're not seeing hierarchies, we're seeing men and women working together for a common purpose. And I think that's really important that we see more of that it gives us a much clearer um, a more hopeful picture actually that's important thank you so much another question here do you think there is going to be a commercialization in the bed sheet with the advent of chinese and indian fabric manufacturing in africa i say this because tanga wood play and sayings by swahili women in us in east africa has been interrupted by China and India commercializing the kanga, and thus the saying that women traditionally produce and receive some remuneration from local manufacturing manufacturers. I mean, we all might hope not, um, but I think it just in the the some of the commentary that I shared with you, women can see the bed, the bedsheet embroiderers can see that happening. They can see the commercialization of their art and they are making the, the very com well convincing and, and emotive argument that bedsheets that are made using machines are not the same. You know, the bedsheet is about more than just the pattern that's on it. It's about the love and the imagination and the imagining of beauty that's gone into that. Um, so I think that's really, that's the moment when, when that gets dislocated, when that gets lost, that's the fear. I think for as long as there's appreciation that a bedsheet and giving a bedsheet is not just about the bedsheet, it's about the love that's gone into making it and it is a form of art and that can't be replicated in a factory um, setting and that's what you're paying for. So for as long as that remains um, and the art form is respected for that, um, then hopefully the commercialized element of it won't impinge on the, the market for these handmade bedsheets. I mean, I should also say um, maybe, yeah, ironically to some extent, I mean, the bedsheet market in South Sudan, as I've said, is largely linked to marriage and marriage practices. But the humanitarian sector that in these safe spaces are encouraging women to develop skills, also encourage women to do things like beading and embroidery, and then have looked to create markets to sell those products. But the market tends to be the humanitarian community itself. Um, so those very, very quick turnover of staff, they come in when they leave, they want to go and, and buy traditional handicrafts. So that market exists. And again, that, that is a market that's not particularly stable necessarily, but it's a market that appreciates um, that these are these are objects that have been that have been made by hand and um, really imagined in a um, in a in a quite a beautiful sense. But obviously, that's more scale. So I mean, it's whether or not um, that market for appreciation of 
of the art in the form that it exists now can be maintained against um, the pressure of the, the commercialized output, which is often cheaper. Um, so, I mean, this is, that's a question for the future in a way, and it's potentially it's quite depressing. But I think if, if, if the art production of art is bringing and is acknowledged as being more than just the product itself, then there's hope that it will continue. Uh, another question here. Thank you for the presentation. Are the basket product made by both the men and women used used mostly by women? So, um, the baskets, yeah. But there's all. They also um, there's a lot of braiding of mats that are used to sit on. So arguably, that's men and women that children use to play with. Um, there's lots of different objects now that are, are created again. There's an extent to which that's been not commercialized, but there's been a change in what's made to try to um, meet kind of change changes in tastes. So actually baskets and objects that were um, braided were not always colored. So the introduction of the dye is something that's new. And that, again, is to try to um, broaden out the market and the desire for these objects. So it used to be an art form that was very just practical, just making the baskets to carry clothes, just making the baskets to go and gather um, the, the ground nuts and so on. But, but now the art's changed into trying to make, make into making things that can be sold beyond, so being sold into the humanitarian community or even sold um, you know, through the, the internet. So there's, there's, there are platforms now that are emerging to try and sell some of these art forms outside of, of South Sudan. I think we don't have any other questions here. And so I'll, I'll, I'll let you, if you do, do you have any, any other thing you wanna say? Um, well, just just to, um, to a bit of advertising while I have the floor. So um, we we will be uh, launching in the next few months um, a digital archive of the art heritage that we've um, that we've recorded through this research project, and that can be found on the website www.genderfocus.org. Um, that will also have a have a window into some more details about the project and a link, as I said, into this digital archive. So anybody that's interested in learning more and seeing more, um, please access via that website. It's not there yet, but it will be. It will be, and we'll, be. <laughs> we'll, we'll check it. Thank you so much again, Professor Bradley, for coming and sharing your research with us. We very much appreciate it. And thank you everybody for coming again and hopefully we'll see you next Thursday. Bye. Pleasure. Bye. Bye everyone.